Um, so without any further ado, I want you to put your hands together for Steph, who's the Senior Product Designer at Entropic. if you work with engineers, first of all, and you're a designer. Hey, that's good. <laughs> Might be relatable then. Um, so yeah, show of hands if this relationship is a positive one. Okay, slightly less. Interesting. Okay, well, I hope we're going to give some tips on like how that relationship, how you can potentially improve that relationship. So yeah, how designers can collaborate effectively with engineers. So as I've said, my name is Steph. Uh, I'm a fintech lead designer and this talk is based on what I've learned working with engineers in the last year and a half, working on a B2B fintech web app at a startup. So this is where I began collaborating closely with engineers. <clears throat> so in my previous job, before my current job, uh, I, was, I got set a project to redesign an investment app and I worked for a couple of months on the screens, made it all like look really nice and Figma, then got to the point where I wanted to hand over the project to engineering. So I got on a call, we were, had an external company, and these guys like in India, uh, they were an engineering company. And I got on a half an hour call with, with this guy and I said like, here's my designs. And he was like, okay, great, cool. <laughs> Sent my file, and that was pretty much it. I remember seeing them kind of float around the figure screen, and I thought, yeah, cool, they're cracking on, clearly. <laughs> Red flag, by the way, like, <laughs> I should have realized. Anyway, a couple of months went by, and yeah, I, I carried on with even more screens and I think they yeah, started to not see them on the figure file anymore. Got back in touch with them and was like, hey, how's it going? Like, you done the app? Like, what's happening? And um, yeah, they got pulled off to another project. We're like, sorry, we never did anything. So six months <laughs> down the drain slightly. Well, not really. I think I've learned a lot from that. And obviously after that, I, I yeah, left that company. Probably don't need to explain why. <laughs> Applied for a new job, um, and this job was a startup, and the majority of people there were engineers. So I really went from like this environment, not really engaging with them or talking to them, uh, to like this environment. This is not to show ratio, by the way. <laughs> just me and all of them, but like it just to show like I all of a sudden was like surrounded by engineers, and I, you know, really needed to like know how to communicate with them. And it was just I was super aware of the skill that I just. Felt like I didn't have, and it really made me reflect on what it would, like as a designer, how you should interact with a developer part to be a good designer. Yeah. <clears throat> so, my first point: be be more careful and more deliberate about the type of feedback you ask for. So, when getting feedback from engineers, I think it's really important to ask for specifics, particularly around feasibility. So asking questions like, can you build this within the given time frame with the current resources? And secondly, is there anything about the design that might be challenging or difficult to implement? So yeah, reasons why I, I would stick clear of asking for a general response. So say, it might feel super natural as well, like you're working super close with these guys. You're saying like, hey, do you like it? What do you think? I think this is can really result in some unclear and non-specific feedback. General feedback really does, like, it It can invite uh, comments around aspects of the design that aren't intended for critique. And I find this often just, if you don't have a really strong, like if you, you should, as a designer, <laughs> have a really strong reason why you've done something, but sometimes it can just turn into a bit of a battle of opinions, and that's just unproductive, and <laughs> you end up talking, you know, the meeting is about feasibility and how can we get this done, and you're asking about whether it should be pink or blue, like, it's, you know, it's just not helpful. And I, I also find if, uh, <clears throat> if you don't ask engineers questions properly, it may seem like you need their approval for uh, the design. So it, again, like, they might lose confidence in your design ability if you're like, oh, do you like it? Are you sure you like it? You, know, you should be confident, this is why I designed it, and these are the reasons why. So yeah, you don't want to kind of, is that idea. <laughs> so, point number two, balance user needs with engineering time and resources. So I think this is particularly true when you need to work fast, and I don't know how many of you work in a startup, like, you need to work fast all the time. <laughs> 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 it's exhausting. Um, 
But yeah, so this was particularly true actually when we were working on a CMS system where we didn't really care about it looking like super shiny and professional. You know, it was it was an internal system, so that's why we didn't care about like it looking super sleek. We wanted it done super quick because it was kind of blocking us. So as a designer, I was constantly asking, how long is this going to take? Is there a simpler way of doing it? Whilst also making sure that we're meeting user needs. So <laughs> another example where this like, yeah, I, I thought went a bit wrong. We we had these showcases on a Friday, which the guys at work who <laughs> knew how much I hated because it was like four, you know, four thirty p.m. and we'd do this big showcase meeting with all stakeholders. It was awesome again. But anyway, we it was great for stakeholders because they could see like what we were up to and everything. But we did used to invite the engineers. Or I think we had one engineer sit there and we used to say like, okay, how feasible do you think it is? And I think that's a quite hard question to ask, particularly when you've not given any context around time. Because I think a lot of the time, you know, you say to an engineer, can you build this? It's like, well, yeah, I can, but can you build it in a given time constraint? That's a different question. So number three, avoid overwhelming handoffs. <clears throat> so if your engineer sees little or nothing until everything is ready from you, that's not just poor communication, but also poor collaboration. And of course, the engineer at this point, that's probably why they get a little bit frustrated with us, is going to feel super overwhelmed all of a sudden getting all these wireframes, all these designs. And I think it's really, you know, it's like throwing spaghetti at a wall and being like, <laughs> and hoping that it sticks. And obviously, as we know as designers, it sometimes doesn't, and that's frustrating for us. So I think key is collaboration and you know, regularly collaborating. They want to twice a week, showing them what an update is, and I think that also helps like really break down the design <clears throat> into like manageable pieces. So it's what's like you know when we do a big design piece, we'll do like different parts and then we'll build it up. I guess it's just an agile way of working, so it's more manageable for engineering. So. Number four, so I'll read one. Okay, so this is another example of, yeah. And yeah, this, this happened a while ago before you start to question <laughs> why I'm talking. But yeah, so we had a, uh, I had a message on linear from an engineer to say, hey, we've got, um, we need an error state design. We've got a situation where the table, you know, they're just seeing an empty table, they don't know why, and it's because they've not got the right permissions. So it's like, cool, like slightly boring, because I'm deep into this other piece of work, and the stakeholder like, wants me to do it for a certain day. So I kind of just put it on the to-do list, and yeah, I forgot about it, basically. <laughs> and then, basically what happened was that the engineer started work, because they just, you know, they're not gonna wait for us. Started work, and he put, through no fault of his own, like this is my fault, he put the error, the error message, in a toast pop-up. So this is wrong for several reasons. Anyone want to say? But yeah, <laughs> number one, it disappears, like a, a toast pop-up often just disappears really quickly. So they might have just missed what the message is, no idea what's going on. Another reason is a lot of users just, you know, when you get a toast pop-up, like, get it away. <laughs> they just, Completely gone, like they're not looked at it, no idea where it's come from. Also, if you navigate between screens, again, they might have missed what where the error has come from. So it's just <laughs> Yeah, so wrong for all those reasons. Um, but problem is design myself had missed the bug on this. So my lesson from that really, I think if I'd been paying attention to the Stand up that we have every morning, I probably would have realised this work was going from the board, mixing designs, and they were just kind of guessing. Um, so I wasn't informed about their schedule. Well, yeah, yeah, I wasn't listening basically. <laughs> it's not, I was a bit informed, but I just was zoning out. So yeah, and I do think, sorry, um, <clears throat> our number one priority as a designer who does work super closely with engineers is to be responsive to their questions. Like, forget what you're doing, forget what the stakeholders ask for. That is your priority to like really like respond to their needs because they're working on the here and now and they could be making UX decisions without you. That's yeah. <coughs> so, number five, effective communication and picking your battles. So going back to the toast story, I um it was quite funny because I was, 
I was transitioning at this point from like designer to a bit of a team need. So I actually could have you know, moved super fast in the startup world, it's a bit crazy. But yeah, we had, I actually, so this came, came into QA, we had to QA it, I looked at it wrong. Being the perfectionist, I wanted to put it back, I wanted to fix it. But however, we had a lot bigger fish to fry. And <clears throat> it was really important for me at this point to pick my battles. So I decided, right, okay, it's not, it's not great. It's not it's my fault, but yeah, it's not great. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to be a blocker here. And we're just going to move on. We've got a new piece of work to fix this. And yeah, set my piece. Let's just like get it shipped basically and work on bigger things. <clears throat> so this is an example of what not to do. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone here has to write tickets. It is a bit boring sometimes, but important. So I wrote this ticket and I will say I did write it a year ago. Um, that saves me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, we had, so we're doing a bit of a bug bash on our platform, and uh, I don't, and you know, I think the request was fine. I think the way I've written it was very bad, to be honest, because basically there was a date picker component and it had too much right side padding, and I wanted them just to make it look consistent, which is a good enough reason. We wanted it to look professional, but I had no explanation as why we were doing it. Were we making room for something else? Was it just, were we, was it just aesthetics? So no wonder, like, this never really got picked up, to be honest. And also, I think the other thing is like I invited them into my own indecision. So I did. I said like, not sure about this. Like, nice to add, don't know. <laughs> so, come on, man. Like, don't do that. <laughs> that was weak. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I really like this quote. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And yeah, and that's why I think, especially. Like today, you know, Bitcoin was super easy to use, AI everywhere, design. It's, it's, the reason we're employed is for our opinions, like our design opinions. And I think we've got to be really solid about that opinion. And, and that's what we're there for, really. <coughs> so number six, be more active in engineering meetings. <laughs> Don't be like Tomar. <laughs> um, so pay attention to the updates. Um, so I, yeah, like I was saying, we had these daily stand-ups every day, and I, I kind of, as a designer, when I was in these stand-ups, I would just zone out, particularly when they're going on about all the technical jargon, like I, I just would be reminded of that message or whatever, I wasn't really paying attention. And now that I've like transitioned a little bit to like lead or kind of doing project managing stuff, I really have to pay attention to what they're up to because you know, they want to know what they're doing next. I have to know, you know, how far along they are. I have to know if they need any support. And um, <clears throat> so here's some reasons why I think it's really important to, I've kind of said a few of them already, but yeah, it's super important to pay attention to your engineering updates and, and be active in those meetings. So number one, technical constraints. You get a better idea of what the technical constraints are. So you can design a solution around that. <clears throat> number two, I think this is the biggest point to honest, particularly for me, project planning and when you work, work super fast. So knowing like where they're at, you know, if something say something's taking longer than they originally thought, great, we've got more time to do user testing, or we don't have to rush. Okay, actually no, they're finishing their thing pretty quickly. We've now got to be super prepared with the tickets that are coming up and like let them know what's going on next. So they don't do <laughs> do like an error message or a toast pop up, for example. And number three, so user-centric solutions. If you're not in that meeting, like I said, they're more likely to make a UX decision without you. And if you show up, you're more likely to be at least asked about that conversation. I think <clears throat> this was something that myself and someone I work with who's here experienced today. It was quite, it was, yeah. So we were in a feasibility meeting, we were talking about a new piece of work that we're doing. And they were talking about what solutions they wanted to do and Basically, they were going to save the user like information into a cookie. So the default, we were going to save like the default, whatever they choose for a default, we're going to save into a cookie, which is bad because it means if they refresh the whole, if they refresh their browser, they have to do it all over again. And that was like, they wanted to do that because it was quick. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> don't bother doing it if you're going to do it that way. Like, please don't do that. <laughs> so yeah, that's just an example of why it's super important that as UX, we're there and we're like, fighting the corner of design and being the voice of the user. 
So, yeah, my point four in that. Don't be afraid, I think this was mentioned before, but yeah, really don't be afraid to ask questions during engineering meetings. I know it's super intimidating when they use all this, you know, technical jargon, but they are, you know, they do, they have, their job is to explain it in a, to non-technical people. So yeah, they, they are there to do that. They do, they do need to do that to not just designers, but stakeholders. And um, <clears throat> I find like asking why doesn't always need to be confrontational. So, you know, like, why can't you do this, what? <laughs> It's like, hey, I'm less technical, do you mind just explaining like what, what, what the reason is? Um, that way you can really understand like, okay, these, these are the reasons they can't do it, but this is how we can like work around that. <clears throat> so, you probably all heard this quote before, but he who asks is a fool for five minutes, but he who does not ask is a fool forever. And just gonna read off the slide here. <laughs> Key takeaways, I mean, you can probably see it all. So, when getting feedback from engineers, it's really important to ask for specifics, especially around feasibility. Number two, consider the impact of your requests on engineering time and resources. Three, avoid overwhelming handoffs by staying in regular contact and collaborating effectively. So not like I was when I was on that project and never spoke to them. Number four, keep up to date with engineering schedules, deadlines and progress, be proactive in addressing their questions and needs. Five, focus on, focus on resolving significant problems before minor. <clears throat> and six, offer clear reasons for your requests. That's why we're here as designers, is to give our opinions, our professional design opinions. And seven, flagging doesn't always mean you need to block. So, working with reasonable compromise, disagree and commit, do a post-mortem, whatever. And eight, don't be like Homer and end engage in the engineering meeting and don't be afraid to ask questions. The end. <laughs> about this relationship between engineering and design. I've got one at the back, two at the back. I'm going to start there. Are you here with me? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've been really excited about this moment. <laughs> um, so we all know, well, firstly, great talk. Thank you. Um, we, as designers, have probably all cursed developers in our time. I've countless times on a weekly basis I've cursed them. Um, but that's our job, right? Yeah. So, we all know about paired programming. We all started to understand about paired designing. And we're starting to understand about paired creating, when designers team up with developers to work with them hand on hand. Just yeah. No need for a meeting, no need for a scheduled call, but just working together to fix the padding and stuff like you said. Yeah, that. yeah. How do you feel this whole COVID situation with the remote working and a lot of companies now using cheaper developer resources in yeah. Eastern European outsource has affected that ability yeah. to be more effective with actually paired creating. Yeah, I think, well, yeah, I think that's the beauty of like the fact that at the moment I'm in a really like close group with them and I re we really do like work next to each other and we're constantly just like, look at this, look at this, look at this. And I think, yeah, if you go away from that and you do have external companies, like what happened to me, you know, external company, and like, yep, 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 sure, 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 like, communication breaks down, the designer is then like, what have you done? <laughs> the engineer is like, I don't really get this, but I'm just going to guess. So, uh, yeah, I, I would really hope we don't go that direction, and I think, I mean, yeah, a bit of a, you know, not, not a lot of people agree with this, but I think, like, you should go in, basically, and, and I think working from home can be a bit of a it can stop you from like collaborating so closely. I really feel it when I'm working from home and I'm not like that. You know, I just make guesses and they make guesses and then we come back and realize we've wasted, we've wasted time, particularly when we need to work super quickly. So yeah, I'd really recommend like just being in the same room as each other, basically. Amazing, thank you. Cheers for that question. Uh, over to you. Hi, thanks for your TED talk on everything that went wrong in your career in the last <laughs> <laughs> Um, my experience with uh, ceremonies has been sometimes that, you know, if you look into the history of stand-ups every day, they are generally for the engineering team, yeah. so we're not always supposed to be there. Could you speak a bit more on how you developed your ceremony 
ceremonies at your company or your, or your current job to make them work better for you so that you know you're finding them valuable and you weren't you know wasting people's time or you were just getting the most out yeah it is hard because you know as much as you want to be in tune like there are times where it, it you can't really understand like yeah I, I will admit to that but i think we do try and keep them short and sweet so it's never ever longer than 15 minutes and if, if it does trail like they'll, they'll say to each other like we're going to take it offline and it's more just we just try and keep keep the board moving basically and make sure that like nothing's blocking so i think the engineers are pretty good at knowing when they're like kind of talking to a bit, bit too much um but yeah yeah because sometimes i just lie in and they don't really want me to do that so <laughs> But yeah, I think, yeah, keeping them short and sweet, like they stand up. The reason they're called a stand up is because you're supposed to stand up and like not sit down and talk forever, basically. Yeah. Stand up. Thank you. <laughs>